Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us um, for this great summit put on by the Returning Citizens Association. Uh, we're going to be talking about financial literacy today with your two presenters here. Uh, my name is Brian Duran. I work with uh, San Francisco Public Library's Jail and Reentry Services. Um, and before we get started, um, I just want to go ahead and go through our uh, land acknowledgement. Um, the San Francisco Public Library Commission acknowledges that we occupy the area now known as San Francisco is the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone peoples of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the original peoples of this land, the Ramatush Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place. We recognize that we benefit from living, working, and learning on their traditional homeland. As uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as First Peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush community. So without further ado, um, just with a little housekeeping, uh, the restrooms are right um, out the doors and to your left. Um, and again, thank you for joining us, and I'll go ahead and pass it over to Anthony. Thank you there, sir. Truly appreciate you and the San Francisco Public Library. Uh, this is truly an honor to have RCA, the Returning Citizens Association, be able to work in conjunction with the San Francisco Public Library. Uh, everyone doesn't get this honor. You know, everyone doesn't get an honor bestowed upon them where you have a platform to give people education. And what better place to give people education in the place that people utilize to expand their minds? And so we actually need people and want people to come back to the libraries. You know, sometimes, I mean, technology has moved us forward in many ways, but it's important for us not to get so far away from education that uh, we start to flounder and move backwards away from our true growth, which is inner and interpersonal development. Y'all with me? So with that being the case, right, um, thank you once again for coming out. I would like to thank uh, the founder of Returning Citizens Association, Mr. Richard Gaines. I would also like to thank his wonderful wife, Andrea. Um, yes. Yes, these, these two have worked diligently and passionately to bring about resources for those of us who are justice and system impacted. And so when we talk about being returning citizens, we have seen that we have been justice and system impacted. So we need these type of organizations that will lead those who have went astray for a long time on the right path. Um, and so I want to say a few things about uh, RCA, but before I do that, I am Anthony Partee, Anthony Martellus Partee. Uh, I am a returning citizen. I am from Vallejo, California, born in San Francisco, a Bay Area native. Uh, but as we say in the streets, and it doesn't stop now, the earth is my turf, you know, meaning that I have the ability to go all around the globe. And I have been around the globe. I remember when I was in Japan, um, it was a beautiful thing. And they were surprised to see uh, 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 an Asiatic of Moorish descent speaking Japanese. You know, and many people don't know that about me. But the fact of the matter is I do actually speak Japanese. So, watashi wa P desu dozo yoleshiku. I ain't trying to show off. That just means my name is P. It's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, <laughs> with that being the case, right, um, I'm going to introduce some things to you about um, RCA. RCA is a group of system impacted people. Even if we have not spent time in the system, you still could have been affected by the system. And we see that happen all over the place because when fathers are taken out of the community, that masculinity that is needed uh, is ripped away. And it's funny because my nieces are actually here and they were on the phone talking to their father and telling their father that Daddy, I'm going to a party. 
I'm going to a party. And he said, well, who you going to a party with? Oh, I'm going with my Uncle P.T. You know, so that shows us the importance of having that man in the world. For so long, we have been told, right, that the I don't need a man for nothing and the man is useless and whatever the case may be. But the fact of the matter is, just like the woman you know, needs the man, the man needs the woman. We need each other. The two is supposed to make the perfect one. And so this is what we are supposed to be doing, you know. And with that being the case, at the same time, you know, whatever your partnership relationship is with who you f deem to be best for you, then that's, that's what's up. But we need people. Human beings are socialized creatures, right, that need other individuals to interact with. If you have to be left alone or in some type of solitary situation, you don't flourish in the manner in which you should. So with that, I'm going to continue on. We are a dedicated organization that supports individuals and their families throughout their entire reentry journey from incarceration to reintegration into society. Our support begins while individuals are still incarcerated and continues as they reenter their communities providing a comprehensive and compassionate approach to reentry. And I must say about RCA, this is very, very true. This is, um, this is not words that just sound good. I recently was struck with a tragedy and RCA lended me several hands because this is an organization. So it's not one person doing something. And all of these people went out their way to make sure that me and my family were taken care of to the best of their ability. And a lot of people talk about it, but this organization, RCA, they actually do it. Um, here at RCA, our mission is to increase the economic, political, and social capital of returning citizens in the United States. That means we aim to provide resources, guidance, and community that can help individuals successfully reintegrate, never go back and rebuild their lives. It is a huge, huge goal, and we cannot do it alone. We need everyone's help. Your support is vital in helping us continue our work. There are lots of ways you can donate. You can do a one-time donation or a monthly donation. You can do Venmo, PayPal, or a Cash App, or you can just turn uh, to our website, which is www.returningcitizensassoc.org. You can also subscribe to our podcast for just $4.99 a month. Just This keeps you informed and inspired about what is going on with Returning Citizens Association. You also can purchase our clothing on rcabay.com. That's www.rcabay.com. You know, it's always good to support the things that you believe in. You may not look at it like this, right? But RCA has a huge job. We are out here targeting individuals who have been targeted by the system. Those same individuals have the potential to be targeting you. And so that small donation has the potential to allow us to help turn them away because of the information that we have. And guess what? You won't have to be worried about somebody breaking your window or breaking into your house. And so it's always a beautiful thing to worry about self-preservation because I'm tired of getting my car busted. That's one of the reasons that I joined this organization so I can help these little jokers stop busting people's windows. And yes, we, we, we hope that this reaches the individuals in the San Francisco uh, County Jail and things of that nature. And so I say to you, young people, listen, it's a better way, man. We definitely don't need you busting windows or busting heads, you know. So we're going to give you the information that can elevate you, man, so you could do something different with yourself. <laughs> As I continue on, we also have our RCA magazine that we issue quarterly called Tapped In Magazine. And that is the magazine that is right in the front. We give a lot of resources to individuals uh, that are incarcerated, you know, as far as job resources. We have listings of jobs that will help you so when you get out, you can find employment. Because at the end of the day, we live in a capitalist society. And if you find yourself without finances, then you may go back to criminality. And we're not trying to have that. So we want to give you not only education, but opportunity. Um, you are also welcome to join alongside of us at RCA. We have many programs to choose from, uh, and I'll mention a couple real quick. The first I will mention is at the heart of what we do. We have a weekly non-clinical mental health support group. 
a safe space for individuals to share their experience and receive support. Um, and ultimately, this particular meeting that we have is, is like every Sunday, and we're able to talk to each other. And we don't realize, because a lot of us in our communities, we don't utilize uh, the mental health professionals. We, it is taboo in our communities. When you get to talking to about talking to somebody about the problems you have, you know, we get to thinking somebody's trying to take us to jail. Somebody's trying to snitch on us. We get to thinking all type of things that most of the time is not even the case, right? And so we offer you a safe space to come in, you know, and receive information because a lot of these people are very wise that you'll be talking to. And so ultimately, it is the concept of the peer helping the peer. We are here for each other because we destroyed each other, so it's our responsibility to help fix each other and help us along the way. Um, we also have a weekly re-entry mentorship, guidance and mentorship to help individuals still incarcerated navigate the re-entry process and get them ready to come home. So we offer phone conversations where individuals can call from the prisons, from the penitentiaries, and talk to our uh, members about what it is that they need to do in order for them to be successful. And that's huge because if you're someone that doesn't have any resources in prison, your family has abandoned you, you have no one, well, guess what? You have us. You have Returning Citizens Association, and this is what it is that we do. Um, thank you. Thank you. And with that being the case, I am going to introduce to you a special, very, very special woman with a lot of information. You know, information that is not just something that you want to know, though knowledge means knowing the ledge. So knowing how far to go in life and when to stop and when to do things. And she has step-by-step -step information that has the ability to change your life. You know, but the blessing is not in the possessing the good things, but in the knowing how to use it. So just because you have the information, she can give it to you. They say the old adage is you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. You know, we can give you this information, but if you don't apply it, if you don't attempt to apply it, and the only thing that is different between the master and someone who has never tried is the master has failed more times than the individual who has never tried. So it is time, right, for you to start trying. Start trying something new. And this is what we're doing. And so I'm going to introduce her. Andrea is a compassionate and empowering life coach dedicated to helping women transform their lives. With a background in nursing and, and with a certification she received in 2013 from the International Coach Federation, Andrea has guided countless women to break through barriers and unlock their full potential through her nonprofit organization, Exchange Mentorship Academy, and her coaching practice. Andrea fosters a supportive environment where women can build confidence, gain self-awareness, and cultivate the tools needed to achieve their goals, including financial literacy. With a focus on building strong connections and understanding each client's unique needs, Andrea is passionate about helping women tap into their inner strength and resilience. She is ready to work with others and to ignite transformation and growth within their selves. She did such a wonderful job that they had to bring us back for part two. So this is part two of Financial Literacy Building Resilience Summits. Can everyone give her a round of applause, Andrea Taylor. Happy Saturday. We made it through the traffic in San Francisco. Ooh, <laughs> I'm just going to say this. Um, we were actually, we took the exit, and the phone, my phone, GPS, kept telling me to go towards San Jose. But yet it said we were six minutes away. And I'm like, why is it telling us to go towards San Jose? I'm not going to take that. I'm going to turn down this way. Um, so we took a right. And so we didn't go on over the freeway, made a U-turn, and we got ready to go straight. And I don't know the streets because I was already getting kind of stressed. 
but it was taking us to mission, to the library <laughs> mission. And something was like, call Anthony and make sure they don't have like several libraries out here. And then he, they got a whole bunch of libraries. I'm like, oh my gosh. But we made it. So anyway, it worked out and I'm happy to be here. Um, we are definitely excited, our organization, our company is excited to come back and present part two of financial literacy. And uh, when we first talked, we talked about com um, compounding, you know, money on top of money, talking about interest, compounding interest. We talked about time and we talked about debt, um, t or taxes, excuse me. Today, we're gonna be talking about budgeting and debt management. We're gonna help you find some money um, because a lot of times when you talk about money and you talk about budgeting, everyone gets nervous. It's like, I don't have no money already. What do you mean find $50, $30, $100? What do you mean? But trust me, when you really start to m make a list of your expenses, then you're able to see, do I really need that? Or is this just my guilty pleasures that I want to keep doing it? You know, if I, am I going to continue to do the $5 Starbucks? <laughs> We call it five bucks, not Starbucks, because you're gonna spend five dollars every time you go. And it probably went up. Yes. I think it went up. Ten bucks. Um, yeah, let's call it 10 bucks. Yeah. Not, not five bucks, but 10 bucks. So we're gonna get into it today. And what I wanna do is go into the re-evaluation um, of our expenses. So we're gonna reevaluate our expenses and look at the possible monthly savings that we have. And I want to make this a little bit more engaging. When you start to look at your expenses and you start to think about how can I find some money to save, this is what you have in front of you. Uh, if you receive a yearly tax refund, adjust what is taken from your paycheck or check with your HR payroll department. Uh, when you start thinking about how can I cut costs with my heat in the wintertime, or the air conditioner, right? You wanna look at uh, eliminating or reducing the premium of cable or satellite. How many people do have cable or satellite? You have cable? I'm just gonna say, did you get upset when you gotta pay that cable bill? It, it's just gotten ridiculous. <laughs> it's gotten ridiculous, but you know, as Anthony mentioned earlier, um, due to technology, we can stream things now. We don't really have to have cable, you know, uh, where you're paying all that money for it. So, yes, we love TV, but what are some other ways we can cut costs, right? So that's something we can look at. Um, use coupons for groceries and dining out. Who, who uh, clip coupons? Anybody? Not no more? I attempted, but it's a whole thing. Like, they really have a doubt in. I think, uh, was it TLC that had a whole TV show on couponing? And they would come out with all this stuff, like detergent and toothpaste and, you know, you name it. And they're talking about, I only paid $5. Well, how? How did you do that? <laughs> but it is a skill. Um, and if you can master that skill, that's another way to save money, right? Um, another one is reduce the number of lattes, alcohol, cigarettes each month, and those are like, I would say, guilty pleasures, right? That is challenging. But something that I just did recently, because I love coffee, I would go every day to get my Pete's coffee, and I say, you know what, enough is enough. Like, how much am I really spending a month on Pete's coffee? And I decided to go into Pete's coffee and buy a half a pound of the, the, the beans, instead of just doing it every single day, going and purchasing, right? Because then you're tempted to also buy breakfast. So that can also add up as well very quickly. Um, so that's one way. Um, you know, when it comes to your cigarettes and alcohol, I don't know exactly what to tell you about that. But you have to maybe say, okay, Sundays is, or not, I wouldn't even say Sunday, but Saturday or Friday is going to be my day where I... I uh, treat myself, right? Just ways to do it. You know, we have to look at what, what do we need and what do we just pleasure. We just want to satisfy that, that 
whatever that taste is for us. We want to satisfy that. Um, eat out early. Choose happy hour menus. Have anyone ever done that before? All the time? Like you decided, I'm not going to go pay top dollar and go have dinner. I'm going to do the happy um, hour or I'm going to eat out early so I can get a, a little cheaper rate on my food. No? So that's another way you can do it, right? My husband and I, we decided to share a plate because let's face it, our plates are huge and we attempt to eat that every single time. Then we're mad because we're like gaining weight or what have you. And we're like, we really didn't need that. But because it was in front of us, we felt like we needed to eat it. I grew up when my grandma said, clean everything on your plate or you can't get up from the table. So when you go to these restaurants and they're packing the, the plate, even though you know you're full, you still know you're going to eat it, right? So that's another way. Take someone, you know, and share a plate or um, do the happy hour menus. Uh, pack your own lunch. Who packs their own lunch? Oh, okay. <laughs> There's some, just keep your head straight if you know you don't pack your own. Just don't even look at anyone. <laughs> but, yeah, that's one thing. Um, meal prep. Maybe on uh, Sundays where you can cook up, you know, your food, get some Tupperware and, and just put it up, you know, for five days, label it. I don't know about you, I do get bored after two days, but if you do bake, let's say, chicken breast, also bake fish, that's one way you can do it, where you can put your food to the side, right, and label it for the week. Um, consider buying used cars. Who feel like they have to have a brand new car? That used to be me back in the day as a high schooler when you don't know no better and then you grow up and you go, wow, this stuff just, it doesn't help you at all because it's like you're enslaved to the debt, right? It doesn't go anywhere because you study, want to keep getting a new car, or what have you, right? But when you're thinking about buying something, uh, look at it being used. You don't necessarily have to pay top dollar, right? Reevaluate your home and auto insurance on a regular basis. We live in California, you know, Prices is constantly rise, rising, and I don't know about you, but insurance companies, are they love to take advantage of, especially what just happened with COVID. I don't know if you experienced this, but now auto insurance is asking for six months up front or nine months even. It's just crazy. But, you know, make sure you constantly, after your, your time is up, look around and always look for the cheaper um, price quote for your insurance. Uh, let's see. Reevaluate. Let's see. Uh, save by carpooling, walking, biking, or taking public transportation. Public transportation has helped us so much when you think about Uber, you think about um, the little bikes they have that you can rent, you know. Um, let's see what else you can think of when, when it comes to carpooling. Carpooling with a friend. Today, Mrs. Davidson and I, we carpooled. And I, by the time we got to the bridge, I was like, man, we could have called Anthony and met him in Oakland <laughs> and just <laughs> carpooled all the way in. But that's another way, you know, when it, when it comes to cutting costs, uh, cancel or reduce extras on your cell phone, data features, right, corporate discounts, things like that. Uh, if you own a cell phone, why keep the old landline? Who got a landline still? In the back. he's like, he's like, get rid of the landline. Do you do you answer it first of all? Are do you make calls from it, or is it just sitting there, collecting money from you every month because you're not even using it? You're just paying the phone company, right? So you don't need it. Mm-hmm. I understand that, yeah. And, well, a long time ago, I used to work for Verizon Wireless, and they used to say if there was a storm or a power outage, at least you had the landline, right? Um, but in today's time, really, you don't really need it. It's not a necessity, you know? Um, and it's just another way to cut costs if you're trying to find money, right, to start saving. Um, let's see. Play free video games. I don't know if anyone in here is playing video games, but play the free video games. Uh, cut down on your online subscriptions. 
cancel magazine subscriptions and automatic renewals. You gotta watch that one, especially if on your cell phone, the apps, they'll say, oh, it's free for 14 days or it's free for seven days. But then they still have you give your credit card or something. And if they, they're hoping you forget, they bank on you forgetting. And the next thing you know, you're getting all these extra charges. So make sure you pay attention to your cell phone subscriptions too. Cancel uh, gym memberships if you don't use them. Find alternative ways to exercise. This is a big one at the beginning of the year. Everyone have their New Year's resolutions and they're like, I'm going to the gym. And they may go for the first seven days and stop or the first three days and they're like, I'm not doing the gym anymore. But then you're still paying this monthly bill and you're wasting money. Sometimes this is hard to hear because people are stuck in what they have and it can be, it's like an ouch. It's like, why are you trying to pull that away from me? But if you're not using it, then why are you spending all that extra money, right? Okay, so cancel or lower accidental death and disbursement policies, cut down on shopping and clothes and gadgets like that. Some people love to shop. Uh, some people love gadgets. You know, the stores love us. They study us. You know what I mean? And if you're anything like my husband, if you're getting ready to get in that line to check out and you see the soda or the candy or the chips, he just got to have it. And I'm like, do you really want it? I just watched my dad do it for years, so I feel like I got to do it. Now my kids are watching. I'm like, you just, they love you guys. They study you guys. That is there because they're hoping you spend money you don't have, right? Okay, so <clears throat> credit and auto appliances, cycles, trailer items you would finance. You know, um, I was gonna comment on that, but we'll keep going. Household services, cleaning and repair, business tax deductions, avoid ATM fees, checking, savings accounts, overdraft charges, bounce checks, money orders, and et cetera. This is a big one. This is a big one because <clears throat> if you're really not budgeting or you're not really paying attention to the swipe of the card, you're just swiping, you know? And after a while, you don't even realize that sometimes companies don't process right away. They'll grab it to see if it's there, but it may take a couple of days and then say you have something else come through or a subscription that you didn't even know was there. You know, anything can happen at that point. And then you find out, I'm overdrawing, I'm in the red, now I got this overdraft fee, you know, those things. Paying attention to your ATM, uh, to your online banking if you don't have it, maybe do that online so, so you can have access to your banking account. Be creative, refrain from overspending on gifts. Gifts gets us all the time. We got birthdays, we got holidays, we got anniversaries, you name it, we wanna celebrate everything. But just think, if you are creative, how much further that will go, you know? I would, I, for Christmas with my kids, I would buy them things that they probably didn't even ask for. And my kids were very easy. They just like, as long as they had their two little figurines, that was it. And I'm like, but you don't want a, a big car? You don't want, no mom, we don't, I don't want that. They would rather go to McDonald's and get the little figurines. So I learned my lesson. I said, stop doing it because you asked them two weeks later, what'd you get for Christmas? I don't know. They don't even know, you know, or take the birthdays. I would, um, I decided I'm gonna create more memories, memories that's gonna stick in their brain. So I would make their favorite cake, I would make it. Then I would invite them in to help me make the cake. What's your favorite frosting, those type of things. And my oldest is 26 and those are the things he remember. But yet we're wasting money. We think we have to do all this stuff, right? So I, I'm telling you all that because Usually, nine times out of 10, once you've cut back and you've looked at all your expenses, you probably have about $100 that you can work with. So remember that because we're gonna get into it in the debt management portion. Okay, so actually I'm gonna go back to that slide. So the potential additional cash flow each month, you know, you're looking at that, but now you gotta look at wants versus needs. Cash flow is a decision. What, what is the potential cash flow that you can save and apply to your debt? So now we're gonna get into the debt part. 
we have $100, you know you have some debt, how can we start to manage this debt? So the common forms of debt, it's common that we borrow money and incur debt during our lifetime. What forms of debt are common? We got the mortgage, we got the student debt, we have the credit card debt, we have the car loan. I don't know about you, but the student debt, I just thought it was gonna go away. I was just hoping that <laughs> biting somebody would just write that thing off and forgive it. It's not going anywhere, it's just not. So what do you have to do? You have to look at all your debt and start to take care of your debt. So credit card debt is something that can grow fast if left unchecked, but it's also something we can manage better, right? We can, we can manage that better now. We can actually look at our debt and say, it's time to start managing it. It may hurt a little bit, it may not feel good, but do you wanna be enslaved or do you wanna be set free? Because that's what it's to do, is to keep you enslaved. And we, we, we need to start living in our abundance. First get free, then we can live in our abundance, right? So let's get into the credit card debt. The average American is more in debt than ever. As of the end of 2020 overall household, debt reached well over $14.56 consumer debt, including mortgages. The average American carries a credit debt, um, credit card debt balance of over $5,315 month after month, not including the mortgage. Do you guys agree with that? Yeah. And it's probably higher because this is in 2020. Inflation has tripled. Aren't we all tired of paying interest to someone else? I know I am. Because remember in, the, in part one, we talked about um, how, it, how, it, how it compels, compelling, compounding, I can't even think of it right now, but it's co compounding, which means you're either gonna be paying compounding interest to someone making them richer, or you can learn how to use different vehicles to make compounding interest work for you. So in part one, we kind of went over that, but in part two, this is what I want to point out. $5,315 month after month, that interest rate is compounding and it's making the creditors richer. That's why I said, are you, are you tired? Because <laughs> I'm tired of it. <laughs> so let's get into the credit card debt. Make a plan to live debt-free. Live within your means and not increase your debt. Understand how your credit card works, the APR, the minimum payment. Uh, the APR, do you guys understand the APR? Do you know what that is? That is, that's the interest, the APR. Um, don't apply for more credit or a higher limit. Many credit card issuers allow you to freeze your credit card to prevent new purchases on your account. Build the habit of using cash or debit and working towards paying off your balance. Did you know you can freeze your credit cards once you paid it off? Anyone? A lot of people think, oh, I paid it off. Woohoo, I'm going to cancel it. You're going to learn later that it's not a good idea to cancel it, especially once you become debt free and you want to buy, purchase, make bigger purchases in the future, you still have to establish a credit score. So it's very important that you don't, you know, cancel it. So we'll get more into that. Now I want to teach you about the debt roll-up. So debt can quickly spiral out of control. If a person is really in a tough position that they can cannot get out of their get out of, there may be a need to explore a debt counseling situ uh, services. So if you have an issue where you just cannot get disciplined and the debt is just getting more and more out of control, you may have to seek counseling for it. Don't be ashamed of it. You're trying to get free, right? Um, but is there another way? Yes, there is another way. It's called the debt roll-up or the snowball method, a systematic approach of paying more than the minimum. Who, who's heard of the debt roll-up or snowball method? Has anyone heard of that? When I heard this for the first time, it was a game changer. It excited me. So we're going to get into it just so I can explain it more. So 
We talked about um, the systematic approach of paying more than the minimum. As soon as the first balance is paid off, the freed up payment amount is used to pay down the next debt even faster. So there's two approaches, which one to attack first. The highest interest first saves the money over time or the smallest balance first, which pays little more in interest but has the greatest emotional satisfaction. And what do I mean by this, uh, the smallest balance first? Pay a little more in interest but has the greatest uh, emotional satisfaction. It's like when you go to the gym and you start having early success and you see that you're starting to lose weight, you get that satisfaction and you want to keep going to the gym because you like how everything's fitting or you like how you're feeling, right? So let's look at it in more detail. The debt roll-up, the typical debt repayment schedule. First thing you're going to do is look at the creditors, all your creditors, largest to smallest. You're going to take it in and list it. Then you're going to look at the balance. Then you're going to look at the interest rate and the minimum monthly payment. Once you look at that, then you're going to look at the credit card balance at the bottom, which is uh, $10 is the minimum payment. So a lot of people, when they have this, this amount of debt, right, and they see that they have the minimum debt, a lot of times you try to think that you're smarter than the creditors and you say, well, I'm going to pay a little bit more on all of my credit cards or all of my debt, right, when really you'll have more power if you just pay the minimum of all the debts and then take the uh, lowest balance and use that money that you would use to spread out to pay the lowest balance off first. So right here where it says credit card debt, you see it's $10 minimum, but that $100 that we talked about that you saved, you're going to use that $100 plus the $10 and you're going to pay $110. And I don't know if you guys can see it, but I'm going to walk. So So you can get that paid off in about two months. Wow. But it would have took you 19 months to pay that debt off. And honestly, if you, have, if you looked at all of this, all of your debt, you calcul calculated everything, and you looked at the pre previous number of remaining months, it would take you 30 years to pay that, that debt off. But when you start to look at it and pay it off, with the debt roll-up, you'll see that when we're done with this, he, they cut their time down to 17 years versus 30 years, right? So once you took the 110 and you paid that first debt off, you want to use that money that you're now used to paying, you take that to the next debt. The credit card debt is 25 minimum, you pay 110, you see the 110 you was paying first, and you take that and add it to the 25. Now you're paying $135 towards that debt. So within six months, you would have paid off two, two credit cards. Do you see how it works? Does it make sense, or do I need to say a little bit more? It makes sense? So yeah, if you want to just take a look at that, and you, and you really just keep rolling it up. You keep rolling it up. If you take that $135, the next debt, you use that $135, now you're paying uh, $185 because, again, you're used to spending that money. So the debt roll-up that we're looking at, you know, what a difference just an additional $100 can make. What about, you know, an extra $200 or $300? Right. So write down in your write down your current debt accounts to begin your own debt roll-up plan. Okay. I see some nodding your head. So this is helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Someone was explaining to me that, like, say, since you're paying like five hundred dollars a month on your car. Mm-hmm. So, so you have your. Um, I'm just trying to. Hold on. Mm -hmm. We got it. We got it. We really want to save the questions, but we got to get we got to give you a mic. We'll let you ask this question. But anybody else that has questions, is that mic up there? Oh, okay. good. Thank yeah, you. We're, we're gonna do all questions later. But go ahead, go ahead. Because you because you asked. It. I'm just trying to understand. My um, I recently purchased a car, mm -hmm. so my sister was encouraging me. Okay, I just say I'm, I won't tell what I pay, but I just say I'm paying five hundred dollars a month. Well, she's telling me go ahead and pay that five hundred dollars. 
and then in a couple of weeks sent in some more money. She said they were, they were bringing down the principal or something. I don't The interest. Is that what you Well, the principal, of? yes. Yes, she's trying to pay extra to alleviate the interest so she can, you can start knocking the principal that down. Is thing you're saying? Can you, that's, we're looking at the smallest debt first. So we're trying to alleviate paying, spreading it out, you know, where you're paying extra here, extra there. I'm paying 30 here, I'm paying 40 here, I'm paying 50 here. We'll take that money and use that towards one bill, the least expensive one, so you can pay that debt off. So instead of me paying that 100, extra $100 toward my car, take that and pay it for your least expensive least bill. Least expensive. Mm -hmm. And get that, bring that down. Yes. Okay. It makes sense? Yes. Yeah, because then you, you'll create that momentum, right? You'll create that momentum and you'll start knocking down that debt first. Yeah. You're welcome. It was a good question, too. Uh, rules of credit. So now I'm going to give you a little, a little quiz. Once a credit line is paid off, is it a good idea to close the account? Yes or no? No, it's not a good idea. We talked about that. It's not a good idea. We don't recommend closing all of your credit lines because they are important to establishing a credit score. A higher credit score may help you receive better lending terms for large purchases in the future. So d develop a good long-term habit, habits, build up your credit, and manage your finances with responsibility and discipline. And if you can do this, then you'll be on a road to success in your finances, and you'll be in control. They won't be controlling you, right? So what we're trying to teach is spend less, save more, earn more. What will you change to save more money? How will your family feel when you accomplish your plan to become debt free? Who are, you going, who, who are you going to work for every day? For your employer, for the government, the bank, yourself, or your family? You're going for yourself and your family, right? Who do you want to benefit the most from your hard work and hard-earned money? You want you and your family, right? Not the government, not the bank, not the employer. You want you and your family. And I, I will admit, it's going to be one of those things where you have to discipline yourself. You know what I mean? You really have to just do it every day. But you will get there, you know? So in summary, I can find ways to save money by consistently reevaluating my expenses, my monthly expenses. I can manage my debt and pay my debt and plan to pay them off faster using debt roll-up. In addition to saving more and spending less, I can find ways to earn more. So when it says I can find ways to earn more, you can start a business. You can, you can find ways to be creative to make more money. Living in California, we have to kind of think like that sometimes anyway. But it needs to be, you know, obviously legal, right? We want it to be legal. What else did you learn that will help you increase your cash flow? What else did you learn that would help you increase your cash flow? And then we'll end with that. Anyone want to say something? You want to say something? He's like, huh? Okay. <laughs> no? Okay. It's fine. Well, I'm hoping that you guys are, you learned that debt roll-up can be a powerful um, plan to help you achieve your goals faster. Because your debt is not going to go away at the end of the day. And at the end of the day, you're going to be going to work every day, you know, and that living paycheck to paycheck is not fun. And not having enough for your bills is not fun. And paying extra in overdraft fees and all those things is not fun. So really taking control, not being afraid to look at your finances and getting yourself out of debt. Okay, so that concludes our session. Thank you so much for inviting us back. I really hope this was helpful. Thank you. And I'm going to bring up Anthony Partey. Our last speaker, last but not least, is Anthony Partey. 
is Anthony Forte. Yes. Anthony is a returning citizen in the truest sense of the word. He is not only a person that has been to prison on multiple occasions, spending time in state prison and returning to us after spending 11 years in federal prison. In fact, he is on federal probation as we speak. And just like there exists light and dark, the duality of life deems that there are two sides to every coin. You are about to meet a man that is not only resilient, but anti-fragile, which means he gains strength through the hardships of life, which I've come to admire about you. Just even coming here and your niece was like, I'm scared. He was like, fear. Fear don't exist. Fear is uh, false illusions appearing real, I think is what you said. False evidence appearing False evidence, and I know that. False evidence appearing real. And he just encouraged me, and I said, well, I better stop being <laughs> too. Shoot. <laughs> you know? It's contagious. It's contagious. And just like there, so anyway, you are, now I lost my place getting all excited about that. Um, but he is a father, a son, a brother, a husband, and a leader of the community. He is the president of the Braca L Incorporated. He is the author of two books and has been featured in RCA's Tapped In Magazine, which is there, and those are his books there. And he has been, I'm sorry, uh, he also has a 12-week financial literacy curriculum. He is a renowned orator who has recently spoken at Chico State University and is con contributing and is a contributing member of the Player Circle podcast. Last but not least, he is a proud and honored member of RCA. It is with great joy and enthusiasm that I introduce to you the Bay Area's own Anthony Martellus Parte. But Anthony, before you come up here, can you say something to us in Japanese? Like, that is so cool. Let's give it up for Anthony. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Once again, watashi wa pi desu dozo yoleshiku. Yes, and when I say pi, you know, it. P is a representation of, I guess, my old street name in a sense. But it's not old because I still utilize it today. Uh, but the things about it is, as I spoke upon before, being the alchemist, we have the ability to transmute the negative and to the positive. And so in the streets, they used to call me P.T. the Great. And now they call me P.T. the Great. But the old P.T. the Great had a lot of negative overtones to it. And now P.T. the Great is an acronym which stands for prosperity training that helps elevate, generate, re-educate, and transform lives, that is. And so that's what I've grown to do. I've grown to give people information that would be able to have the ability to transform their lives. Um, it is a pleasure to see you all. Um, and I just want to thank each and every one of you for coming out. In fact, can you give yourself a round of applause? You know, um, building, you know, Resilience Summit, it's a very, very powerful thing. Oftentimes, we complain or we are harmed by what life has to throw at us. And some of us sometimes don't have the ability to get up off of the ground. And this is where resilience comes from. This is where resilience comes in. You have to have the ability to get up when they knock you down. When life starts, as they say, life be life in, when life starts to life and it starts to hand you hardships, it starts to hand you turmoil, it starts to hand you fear, right? You have to find within yourself the ability to overcome all of those things. How do you do that? You already look back on the things that you've already overcome. You use your past, right, as fuel to propel you forward. This is how you overcome what it is that you're dealing with in the moment. And so 
when I look at my hardships, I may be dealing with something. And then I just realized that um, I was facing uh, 40 years with that, with two life sentences at 21. And I defeated it because I'm standing here in front of you. Okay. I realized when things start to get hard that um, I just did 11 years in federal prison. I remember having to stand in those chow hall lines. I remember having to be harassed and stripped and, 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 and dehumanized in a sense, right? I remember those moments, but guess what? It didn't break me. It only made me stronger. So whatever it is that I go through, I have the ability to look back on what it is that I dealt with and know that whatever it is in front of me is not more of a hardship than what I've dealt with already. They say that calm seas do not make for good mariners. That means those of us who have been through some things, we can go through some things. And life will hand you a deal that is raw, but as long as you have the ability to continue to be resilient, right, then you can overcome anything that it is that you're dealing with. Um, I have a question for you. By a show of hands, how many of us believe that being brainwashed is a bad thing? By a show of hands. Okay. So the majority of us in here, we raised our hands. Well, I have some bad news to deliver to you. Being brainwashed is not a bad thing. Let us look at the words that are being used. See, we use words because they have definitions. And so we can, um, a person does not know by being told. If they must know, they must be what they know. And so therefore, we can't allow society or anyone else to shape our perspective by telling us what something means without us doing any further investigation, right? And so... Now, some of y'all, I could hear y'all saying, no, because brainwashing is a bad thing. Uh-uh, girl, don't let that man brainwash you. You know, we, we had these type of conversations and all of that. Oh, oh yeah, they trying to play you. He trying to uh, 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 put a battery in your back and brainwash you and send you out there to do something crazy. These are the type of conversations we have when we start talking about brainwashing, right? But let me bring some practical things to your attention. So when you go to the restroom to wash, and you need to wash your hands, right? Cleanse your hands. What is it that you do? You wash them, right? When you need to, you've had a long day of work and you're ready to go to sleep, you don't just go lay down in the bed. I sure hope not. Uh, <laughs> some of us, our circumstances may be a little dire, but please get this water if you can. So with that being the case, if we, after we get off of work, what do we do? We go in and we wash ourselves, meaning we cleanse ourselves, right? Even when your car you riding in is dirty and the kids are making stick figures on the car and putting smiley faces on there and people, the, the teenagers telling you, wash me and do all those type of things, right? <laughs> when they're doing these type of things, what do you do? You take your car to the what? The car wash. So we understand that in order to cleanse something, right, we have to wash it. So who doesn't want us to be brainwashed in? We have to think about that because society, in a sense, has put us a brain stain on us, right? They have put into our heads a bunch of things that do not aid us in our prosperity, right? It may aid others. For example, since we're talking about financial literacy, we are taught that as soon as we get some money, YOLO, what does that mean? You only live once, so don't worry about saving nothing, putting anything away. Matter of fact, spend it. We're talking about blowing money fast. We're talking about getting rid of it as soon as you get it. You need some new Gucci shoes. You need some new shoes, clothes. You need a brand new car instead of buying a used car, which is going to depreciate after a couple of years. It's the same car, right? But I know for some people that's watching this, they're like, oh, he's talking crazy, especially when Andrea was up here talking about cutting back and things of that nature, uh, so some people can't even stomach that. What? You telling me I, I, I shouldn't go buy these $950 shoes? No, you shouldn't. 
I mean, and you you definitely shouldn't be going and buying nine hundred fifty dollars shoes if you haven't put yourself in a position to uh, try to own your home. Uh, you know, get you some investment properties. Um, if you're not investing already, like, what are you investing in? Uh, it was funny. I was watching a video one time, and they were talking about Apple, and they said that if you bought the Apple phone every year from the time that it came out you would have spent about $20,000, you know, from now, right? And if you would have took that same $20,000 and spent it on Apple back then, you would be a millionaire many times over. And so this is what we are trying to give to you. We are trying to give you a paradigm shift Meaning we are trying to give you a new perspective that will allow you to do different things in your life, to make different decisions. Because the battlefield of the world, right, is here. Okay, life really only exists here. How do we know this is true? Because we all can see the same incident, right? But we all see it differently because we've been shaped by different world perspectives, okay? And so we need to start to change our mind. We have been taught to be consumer. Well, who does these, this consumerism help? It helps the big corporations. It helps those individuals who are pushing an agenda that they want to get in your money, into your pocket. And so I've said this before, but I want us to realize something because I need to push this home to you. If we start to evaluate our money differently, right, then we will start to spend our money differently. Let's look at it like this. Money, right, which represents value, and the value that it represents is your time, okay? Your most valuable resource that you have is your time. You can go print up all the paper you want. Uh, the, 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 what is that? The current, foreign currency exchange market, right, it trades trillions of dollars a day. This is paper stuff being electronically traded back and forth a day. So plenty of money can be made and plenty of money can be lost. The moment, yesterday you'll never get back. I don't care how much money you got. A week from now, your daughter or son's birthday last year, you'll never get that back. That time, you can't get that back. So people, we judge value by its scarcity. So things that are scarce, they are more valuable. And so for us at the bottom, right, money is super valuable because we don't have the printing press that they have at the top. <laughs> so they could just print the money. And so it's not, it's really nothing to them, right? But for those of us who have to work hard for our scantiest means, you know, the money is hard to come by, and so we put it above everything else, but it's not above everything else. It is just a representation of what is truly value, which is your time. Money is supposed to give you freedom. This is what we are all, search all are searching for, freedom, freedom to do the things that we want, when we want, and how we want. This is what we're looking for. Money only represents that, and so we have to understand that. So that we understand um, what money is and, and, and the value of it, let us go back to something that we talked about earlier, right? Um, I was talking about time, I'm sorry. So now, when you, let's, make, let's say you make $200 a day, you make like $28 an hour or something like that, right? When you are spending your money, I just bought my daughter uh, a refrigerator. She's going off to college and stuff like that, so they need uh, refrigerators and stuff for the dorm. I didn't know that initially either because when I was going to college, you didn't have to buy refrigerators and stuff, but I was told by Andrea she had to do the same thing for her son, right? So my daughter, she needed a refrigerator for a room, so I made sure that we provided that, and I thought about it. Now, this is not a negative thing, but... The refrigerator cost about a couple hundred bucks. So if I'm an individual that only makes about 200 bucks a day, right, that $200 cost me a day's work to make sure that she had this refrigerator. But it's important for my daughter to be able to have this refrigerator. Andrea introduced to us wants versus needs. So when we talk about the difference between a want versus a need, a Gucci shoe that costs 950 
is a want. It's not a need. Right. And so that 950, if I'm at 200, we're talking about four, almost five days, really basically five days, a whole week's worth of work, eight hours, you know, 40 hours worth of my life that I'll never get back in some shoes that eventually are going to be turned over, turned upside down. And somebody that doesn't have a place to live or something like that, you'll see one of these homeless people in the shoes eventually. You know what I mean? And there's nothing wrong with donating and making sure people are uh, uh, given things, but it's not going to last forever. This is all I'm saying. So we put value and pride in things that are not going to last forever. And that does not make any sense. A wise man once said that if you judge people or if you judge something, a fish, by its ability to climb trees, you're going to think that it's stupid. And that's stupid. Now let's look at this. Why do I bring this up? Why did I bring up the cleansing situation? Here at Returning Citizens, right, for a long time, those of us who have been adversely affect by, affected by the system have been cast away and thrown to the side as if we had no value whatsoever. And now when we look around and we see people in these organizations who are helping the homeless get, get, get placement in homes, who are helping people stay out of prison and turn away from criminality and things of that nature, who do we see? We see these returning citizens doing this work, right? But forever you were deemed to be nothing. And so now you are needed. You are needed, but I want to give you something. Because this is why this is going on. They say that the rejected stone, right, of yesterday, right, becomes the cornerstone of tomorrow. I want to let you let that sink in. The rejected stone of yesterday. We were despised and spit on and talked about and brushed aside and rejected. But now today we are becoming the cornerstones of society. We are the ones that you look to when your child is acting out. Because we've been there. We were those young people who acted out. And so we know how to deal with them when you don't. But it's okay. Because we're not mad at you. In fact, we appreciate the opportunity, right, to right some of our wrongs. To be able to help society become better. Because we've harmed it and we've wronged it. And now we want to do our part. So I want to also encourage you with this story. Because a lot of times we find ourselves doubting our abilities, right? But sometimes we just really dealing with the wrong tools, okay? And so there was a farmer, and all of you will be able to understand this. There was a farmer, and he worked very, very hard. So we could not say that he was not ambitious and he didn't put the work in needed to be successful. But for some reason, when he would plant his crops, he would reap and he would reap and attempt to, he would sow and he would sow and attempt to reap, right? He barely reaped enough to feed his family. And he couldn't understand because it wasn't his hard work, it wasn't his skill, but for whatever reason, the land upon which he attempted to grow would not grow the food that he needed. So they barely got by. And so one day, a traveler was walking by, and this individual was a miner. He had the ability to, in a sense, by the soil, see under the ground. And so when he walked by and he saw this farmer working very hard, he stopped him and he said, what are you doing? The farmer said, I'm, I'm, I'm attempting to feed my family and make a living. I'm not doing very well at it, but this is what's going on. He said, well, the reason you're not seeing success is because this land is not made for what it is that you're doing. He says, why don't you get new tools? And instead of planting, why don't you start to dig down deeper into the soil? I can guarantee you're going to find what it is that you look for. And so the farmer started to dig. 
And he got a he got a few feet down and he was like, oh man, I don't see anything. This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. But you know what? I don't really have too many choices, so I'm going to dig down deeper. And so he continued to dig and nothing happened. But instead of giving up, he, he became resilient and he continued to dig. And all of a sudden he hit a clink. And once he hit that clink, he started to dig, he started to dig. And what he found was gold. You see, the land that was producing, that held the gold, was not going to produce the farmland in the manner in which he needed it. And so the moral of the story is sometimes, right, we have to dig deep within ourselves to find the jewels that we are looking for because everyone else in the world is giving us these surface level things that they are doing, but it doesn't work for us. So when you start to dig deep into yourself, meaning you start to do self-evaluation, you start to change your mind, you start to put forth efforts, instead of watching TV, you read in a book. Instead of going out on Friday, you know, you stay home and start to develop a plan that's going to change your future. See, that's digging deep inside yourself. You're looking for the jewels. You're looking for the gold. You're looking for value. Because the most valuable thing that you have is you. And once you start to understand that, then there is nothing that you can't do. So, you know, in that, right, I, I want to touch on this as we talk about how we have been deemed for a minute, right? Because this is important, this resilience. I know we're supposed to be talking about financial literacy, and I'm going to get to some money in a second, okay? I'm going to give you some game about something in a second. And remember, game is generating and manifesting elevation. This is what I talk about when I talk about game. Okay, but I want to share something with you. Once again, for a long time, they have said that you were valueless, and it's not true. It's not true. But we find our value in everything outside of ourselves, so much so that we think if we put on certain type of clothing and we wear certain things that it makes us valuable. It makes us that person. And that's not the case. It's not the case. Because when you're that person and you walk into the room, it doesn't matter what you have on or what you got going on. Everybody knows. They can feel it. They can see it. They understand. Okay? And so I'm going to tell you a story about the truth, right, and how powerful it is. So one day the truth, being you, right, the truth was walking down the street. And uh, he had a speech to attend to, kind of like this one. He had a speaking engagement to attend to, kind of like this one. And as he was going and traveling along his way, Truth happened to walk by an alley. And something jumped out, hit Truth upside the head, Truth knocking Truth out. And all of a sudden, it took all of Truth's clothing. And so that individual that I'm talking about, that individual was called a lie, right? And so Truth was knocked over the head, dragged into the alley with all of his clothes stripped off of him. And Lie put on all his clothes and he got the moseying on down because Lie was about to go talk to the people and tell the people what's going on and what they should be doing because really that was Truth's job, right? But Truth is unconscious. And so he travels and he gets there and Lie is up there telling everybody what's going on. He's talking to the people, and the people are like, yeah, I'm feeling that. And so, truth, he starts to wake up out of his slumber, regains consciousness, and being the diligent individual and duty-bound individual that truth is, he rushes to speak to the people. And when truth pulls up, he's like, hey, wait. Nobody listened to this dude. He's a lie. And the people... They started throwing fruit at him and all type of stuff. Get out of here. We don't want to hear you. You're nobody. This is the truth. I say that to say that even in these day and times, after all that we know, people would rather have 
a well-dressed lie than the butt naked truth. And this is <laughs> and this is what we are dealing with. So what I'm going to introduce to you today for a few more minutes, right, before we get to our question and answer session, I'm going to talk to you about some things that most people can't talk to you about um, because it's roughly, uh, it's new technology, right, but it's money. I'm going to, how many of you by a show of hands have heard of Bitcoin? Okay, that is a beautiful thing, right? And when we talk about Bitcoin, right, Bitcoin is what you call money, okay? It is money. It is money just as the same way that we consider fiat paper money, right? The only difference is it's actually more money than fiat paper money. The fiat paper money, as I explained to you before, right, is money because it is decreed money. It is government decreed money. That's actually the definition of fiat. Fiat means money that is decreed. Okay, by the government that they will accept it for payments of taxes and debt. Okay, the reason that that is very, very important for us to understand is because the world is going into a new system. Okay, and what I don't want for you to do is be left behind. This is what's going on for a very long time. Right. People have been told that Bitcoin is a scam. Cryptocurrency is a scam. And we've been told this by a lot of people in power. But we didn't understand why we were being told this. We were being told this so that other people could get in position. And then later on, they could all sell to you, you know, and you wouldn't have the opportunity to be in position. Well, let me tell you something. Who do you think the largest holder of Bitcoin is? the United States government. Yes, they are the largest holder of Bitcoin. Uh, you have companies like BlackRock. BlackRock is the largest asset manager in the world. Asset manager in the world. They have a Bitcoin ETF. This stuff is important because you do not want to find yourself being left behind, right, when things are happening in the future is rolling. And so I just wanted you to understand that you should look into these things. Get informed, not only about uh, uh, cryptocurrency, but artificial intelligence, all of these things, you have to know about these things. We can't sit back in the world, right, and just think that uh, we don't have to participate in how the new world is gonna look. If you pay attention, uh, in almost every store, they have self-checkout lines, okay? In fact, we're all, for the majority of the part, from the Bay Area. Do you guys, some of you are old enough and some of you are not, do you remember when the toll booth had people that actually worked <laughs> in the toll booth? You had to stop at the toll booth, give them some money, then you could go through? Well, all of that has been automated, okay? They don't need people any th there anymore, Right. But I'm not giving you this information so that you could become afraid of the future and say, oh, my God, technology is going to take over. I robot. I'm not saying any of that. What I'm telling you is you have to get information so that you can learn how to utilize these things best for yourself. For example, in San Francisco, they have something called the Waymo. It's a Jaguar that drives around. It's a uh, autonomous vehicle that has no driver in it, right? Well, how does that benefit you? Yes. How does that benefit you? How can you make it benefit you if you understand technology? This is how. You have smart contract platforms like Ethereum and Solana. What is a smart contract? A, contra a smart contract is the ability of the contract, right, between two people or entities, right, to do business without having to have a middle person, right? So now the smart contract, it does everything for you. It is, a, it, is a, it is a software program that basically is going to do everything for you and ensure that you get rid of the middleman. So you don't need to go to the lawyer. You don't have to go to the judge. You don't have to get permission to do these things. You have to do none of these things, right? to do business. So now I may not know the majority of you, but guess what we can do? 
we recognize that this autonomous driving vehicle is going to be around and that people eventually are going to use it. So we could come together, right, put money into this autonomous driving vehicle, buy us one through the smart contract, which will divvy up all the money so you don't even have to trust me. This is why it's a trustless system. You don't have to know me. You don't have to trust me. We can be from all the way in China. We can be from Africa. We can be from New, e New Zealand or Mexico or the United States. It doesn't matter where we're from, but we can do business together, right? And so how do we take it? Why is that important? It's important because now we're the owner of that vehicle. Other people are going around getting into the vehicle and then they're paying us through the vehicle. So now this is how you start to make passive income in the future. This is why this stuff is important. You don't have to be afraid of the technology and what is to come. You just have to understand it. See, people fear what they don't understand and what they don't know. So once we start to understand that, we can start to do different things. And this is coming in the future. It's not really a bad thing. You just have to understand. So get education because this is important. That's why you got to come to this library. They have books on this stuff. You should start to read. Because the club is still going to be there. In fact, eventually you're probably going to have some VR glasses on in your house, dancing in the house like you at the club. I'm just saying. That may be what's going on, you know. So um, I just wanted to give that to you guys, right? Um, and last but not least, as I get down here, you know, I wanted to touch on something because she was talking about credit earlier, right? It's important for you to understand the credit system. It's important for you to know how the credit system works. I had a friend, he would spend, I think his credit card was like maybe 500 bucks or something, but he would spend the whole thing every month. And then he would go and he would pay it off and he would say, well, why doesn't my credit card, why doesn't my credit ever grow? You know, things of that nature. Um, but if you don't understand the system, right, 30% of your credit is credit utilization. And so when you understand that 30% of your credit is credit utilization, if you are using more than 30% of that particular credit card, it's going to affect you negatively. So you have to know these things. You have to understand that age of credit is 15%. That payment history is 35% of your credit. You should know these things. But most people, they're, they're not going to teach you this. They're not going to give you this information. The credit companies are definitely not going to do that because as she was talking about compound interest, it works the other way. Just like when you invest and you make compound interest and it's a great thing, well, it's a great thing for them because they're making the compound interest on you. And so get you some financial literacy, get you some financial education. As I've said before, I have a 12-week course and it is offered online. And we give you from the basics to very, very complex financial understandings. And so you should take the time to educate yourself. You should take the time to put yourself in the rooms with different people, okay? And with that, we are going to get to our question and answer portion, and uh, I appreciate all of you for coming out. Thank you. Anybody have any questions that they would like to ask? Thank you. So um, for people that don't really have a lot of money and they want to try to invest money in Qatar, you were talking about the Bitcoin and other different and other different platforms. What platform would you suggest they try to invest in if they have, say, they only have like two hundred dollars out of their check within the like two weeks? What is something that they can invest in that they that you think they would see some type of growth in? I know it's not going to be instantaneous. It could be later down the line. But what do you think would be a good platform? Well, the first thing that we would have to do is talk about some things, right? Because what, when you, first and foremost, I'm not a financial advisor, so I cannot give anyone financial advice. <laughs> Let me say that for the people be kicking down my door and SWAT gear coming to get me. <laughs> okay. But um, if I was just talking to someone, telling them some of the things that I might do, I would first want to know uh, your risk tolerance and your risk aversion. 
I would want to know uh, what are some of the things that you like and you're into. Uh, can you stand losing certain amounts of money? Because you have to be able to, when you talk about investing, you have to be able to uh, risk those finances. And most people, they have the perspective that I'm not going to risk my money. I'm scared to death. You know, and so, and that's okay to be uh, uh, risk averse. That's what that's called in the in the investing world. It's called being risk averse. And so, we would first have to understand where their risk uh, uh, aversion is and tolerance, uh, meaning what type of money they want to see, you know, and what type of risk they're willing to take. But to be honest with you, there is just no uh, one answer to say, oh yeah, you should invest in this until I understand their situation uh, uh, first and foremost. But there are plenty of things out there. I'm a I'm a heavy uh, cryptocurrency person because I believe that is the future, you know. And so I look further into the future. I see that the dollar is continuing to be devalued. Okay, so if I'm thinking about saving my money under the mattress, I'm not going to do that because the dollar is being devalued. This is why we spend it so fast because we know that uh, every the prices are going up. So we're trying to get it out our hands like hotcakes. Um, and so that's very important. So I want to invest in something that's going to give me a return, a, a, a return that I'm looking for, you know, and if I want more re return, that means that I'm, I'm dealing with a riskier asset in a sense, you know, um, and if I want a smaller return, then I can go with what they call a safer bet. But it's seeming today the safer bets are not as safe. So, Andre, you have anything to say about that? Well, in our company, we definitely have over... Um, 80 some companies that we deal with and it's not a one size fit, fits all. So I would have to actually do a, a financial analysis with you and take a look at what you're, take a look at what you're interested in and what works for you. But we won't know that until we do the financial analysis to see what you're looking for. Yeah. I have one more question as well. Um, so I want to know more about, do you think you guys could offer something about learning more about building business credit? We do have a, a business expert that I can introduce you to, and we can talk further about that, but we can contact each other one-on-one -on -one and have that conversa conversation. That'll be more in our whole um, overview that we would give you. And then once you really see exactly where you want to go, then I can get you in contact with that person. Um, and also in reference to that, uh, Barker L Incorporated in our financial literacy curriculum, we actually have a portion of our course that's dedicated to building business credit. So we deal with personal credit, we deal with business credit, we deal with time preference, uh, we deal with many different things. And so definitely when it comes to business credit, we can definitely uh, help in that particular manner. And that could be found at www.barca dash e l i n c dot i n thank you what's your ski number there your qr code anybody else with any questions okay well with that being said right before we go because we're about to go if that is all with the questions um this is something that I, I forgot to share with you that is very, very important. So <laughs> I'll get this to you now before we go. Um, and in, finance, in the financial world, they have something called time preference, right? And so you have people with high time preferences and you have people with low time preferences. Now, we are aware of all of these people and some of us are either or and at different times we can, we can have been both, right? But um, I'm going to tell you a story so that you can understand. I like telling stories. People get the point from them. So there was two individuals, right? Uh, one named Dante and one named Waikisha. Now, I don't know where she got this name from, but Waikisha's a very smart lady, let me tell you. So this is back in the days when people used to... Uh, have to survive in a, like a hunter-gatherer type of manner. And so this was a fishing village that they lived in. And Dante and Waikisha would both be out in the river, and they would be catching fish with their hands. And so they would catch about three to four fish a day. 
But the difference between the two was the mindsets. So Dante, he was happy catching his four fish. While Keisha, she was not so satisfied with what it was that she was, how she was living and what it was that she was catching. So she decided to actually work a little less than Dante, right? But spend time building an apparatus. An apparatus is just a tool, right? And so as Dante would work and he would build, he would get four fish and Waukesha, she probably got like one fish a day. And so she was just kind of scraping by. So everybody in the village was kind of making fun of her because Waukesha seemed kind of crazy in a sense. She went and got a stick and, you know, it was like a little twig thing and she tried to put some type of string attached to it and, and she happened to put a hook or something on the end of the stick with the string and she would stand at the water. And all of a sudden, after about a month, this stick with this string and this hook, she finally got it to work in. And she used half of the time that it took Dante to get four fish, she started to make four fish, she started to get four fish with that hook, that string, and that stick. So she got four fish in the same amount of time it took Dante to catch fish with his, with his, with his bare hands all day. But Waukesha didn't stop there. And so, of course, the village, they still would make fun of her because they didn't understand. And she seemed to be an outcast because she did different things differently. So she started to cut down some wood with the other four, four hours that she had and, you know, try to put it in the water and see if she could make it float. And eventually, Waukesha started to get something floating in the water. So she floated in the water with her little fish thing, you know, and she started to get a lot more fish. It was amazing. Then Waukesha went on to knit some type of thing that looked, I guess, I don't know what it was. You had the ability to cast it out into the water and it would just drop into the water and all of a sudden it would have a bunch of fish in it and she would pull it out of the water. And so once she developed that, I think she called it a net, right? Dante was still catching fish with his hands. Well, as the future went on and Waukesha took her tools, these nets and this fishing pole and this floating thing in the water that they call a boat, she would go out deeper into the lake and she would catch fish that they'd never seen before. Exotic fish, beautiful looking fish. So much fish that she could feed her and everyone else. Well, if we look at Waukesha's progeny, right? Now they are the fishing magnets, those very wealthy people who have had the ability to enjoy what we call the, far, the finer things in life, right? And Dante's progeny, well, they're kind of still doing the same thing that they were doing then. Maybe they're not fishing with their hands. Maybe they're just going to the grocery store and, you know, buying things that, you know. The point is this. You have to take time to build tools that will build wealth for you and your family. Everything is not about money. Value is more important. But at the same time, you have to build wealth for your family. And you're going to do that by creating things. You don't have to chase money, okay? All you have to do is create value. If you create value, people will bring you their money, I promise you. All of the people that you see, the majority of them that are rich and wealthy, they created something. And people, we happily go to Facebook. We happily go to Apple. We happily buy Michael Jordan tennis shoes. We happily do these things. Other people had these ideas. They created them. Don't just be a consumer. Be a creator, and you will have the ability to have the type of lifestyle that you live. And with that, we want to thank you. Uh, Andrea, do you have anything to say before we go? You know, I think the number one thing that has come up, I think you said it too in the beginning and you said it, mindset. You gotta develop your mindset and shift the way that you've been thinking about things. Unlearn some things that you 
know that in your mind you think is right because a lot of times we pull from our influences, we pull from our environment, but if nothing else, get the information, invest in some good books to understand money properly. And the biggest thing is your mindset and how you feel about money. How does it make, it make you feel the minute you bring it up? If you find that you get scared or nervous or you feel like you're about to get judged or slapped on the hand, then there's something going on. There's a belief system that needs to shift. So personal development and changing your mindset. Invest in your mind. And that's it. Thank you guys so much. Thank you all, Anthony, Andrea. That was awesome. Thank you. And give it up. If you'd like more information on RCA or um, what the library offers, we do have some pamphlets in the back. And um, again, there's also snacks back there still. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.